on November 8th, 2021, a YouTube video called Analog Horror Boil Advisory Part 1 would be uploaded on the channel Vintage 8. He would go on to upload many more short films and analog horror series, all seemingly disconnected from each other. In reality, these videos were all part of an interconnected analog horror universe being built around the channel. The fact that this channel is creating an overarching narrative revolving around these mysteries is almost completely unknown. With this video, I want to begin to bring to light what's really happening in and around the small Louisiana town of Cates Crossing, starting with the series' first two entries, The Tangy Virus and The Oracle Project. We begin with the logs of a researcher stationed at the Cates Crossing Health Unit. Her name is Dr. Julia Williams, and on August 8, 1988, she records her discovery of an unidentified disease. This unidentified infection has been reported from individuals who swam in the Tikfar River. Blood samples of the patients were ordered, and water samples were taken in relevant key areas. The results were expected in about a week. The next tape, which takes place 10 days later, shows that these results were inconclusive. The blood and water samples did not present any information that could assist in this investigation. In the meantime, most patients' symptoms seemed to have improved, whilst a small outlier had theirs worsen with meningitis. All the while, 28 new patients have been admitted with the same symptoms. It is here that Dr. Williams makes the assumption that it is a viral infection. The one deceased patient is discovered to have a tumor left behind near their spine. The third tape skips forward several months in time. It is now November 5th, 1988, and Dr. Williams has finally identified the disease. After confirming through blood work from patients, she has decided to aptly nickname the newfound pathogen the Tangi virus, after the Tangipahoa Parish and river in which it was found near. The local parish government is notified and the samples are due to be sent to the Center for Disease Control for further research. After examining the tumor that was left behind from the deceased patient, Dr. Williams makes a terrifying discovery. The virus seems to have given birth to many worm-like parasites. Additional thoughts. The idea of discovering a new virus is both terrifying and exciting. I'm just glad we identified the pathogen before it had a chance to spread. Two months later, a week after the turn of the new year, no news. Dr. Williams' supervisor claims that the CDC is still processing the samples, and she is being assured the virus is not dangerous. Based on her own research, this obviously makes zero sense. The virus initially reproduces in a lytic cycle. This means that infected cells get destroyed in the process. In time, the virus evolves through metamorphosis that gives birth to the worm-like parasites described earlier, and the parasites immediately target the brain and nervous systems, hinting towards a possible attempt at taking over the basic functions of its host. Survivors show negative results for the original virus. Autopsy might be the only way to detect the secondary parasitic infection. This is beyond concerning, and Dr. Williams decides to take matters into her own hands and contacts the CDC herself. There's no way this virus is not dangerous. The CDC hasn't received our samples. When confront as to why, my supervisor claims that another parish confirmed that the pathogen to be Giardia. I find this to be not only outrageous view inane. Why would he lie about sending the samples to the CDC? And Giardia, a grade schooler wouldn't confuse Giardia with the Tangier virus. Something nefarious is clearly happening here. Dr. Williams' supervisor would have no reason to lie and then backpedal and say that the samples were never sent at all once the lie was uncovered. It almost seems like he's trying to hide something. Three months pass. 
At this point, it's been well over half a year since Dr. Williams originally discovered the virus, and there's no telling what kind of damage a virus like it would cause if left unchecked for that long. How many have been infected now? Hundreds? Thousands? More? Despite all of this, the parish government is actively promoting the use of the waterways in which the virus was found. They are ignoring the safety of the citizens in order to prevent scaring away tourists, since it's a big source of money for the parish. This is unacceptable. This is the tipping point. However, Dr. Williams has more concerning matters to worry about. Patient 4, who she previously examined for the Tangi virus, has murdered her husband. She also murdered the parents of patient 1, who was an asymptomatic infant, and then stole the child. Patient 3, a young boy, also violently attacked his parents. All three of them were last spotted in the waterways near Kate's Crossing, which isn't far from where the virus was discovered. To add insult to injury, several people have been reported to have gone missing on or near the river. This is too strange. It seems like too much to be a mere coincidence. We skip to October. It's been over a year since the virus was discovered now. The summer months of Tangipahoa tourism go as bad as expected. Many get sick, but few suffer many consequences and get better quickly. This means nobody's worried about the secondary infection. Nobody in Dr. Williams' department seems concerned at all, despite her constant pleas for more attention to be brought to the issue. Mysteriously, the parish government is building a landfill right next to the river now. This seems immediately counterproductive, as it can easily pollute its surroundings, right? Uh, rumor in the town says that it was constructed as a cover-up. Dr. Williams doesn't have time for that, though. She has bigger concerns. Alien spaceship cover-up conspiracy theories are just not at the top of her priority list. It's time for her to threaten to go to the press. Surely then, someone will listen to her. Addendum, and I was terminated, effective immediately. However, when I returned to my office, I found a tape on my desk. There was a note that simply said, Lab 8, come at night. Later that night, Dr. Williams returns to her office. Her supervisor, the very same one who denied that any issue was going on, along with his assistant, were actually the ones who left that tape. He was hiding something. They've been trying to figure out who they can trust with the threat, and believe the parish government is mostly infected and therefore corrupt. This is possible because the virus is sentient. The problem is far larger than Dr. Williams could have ever imagined. The tumor that Dr. Williams found on the spine of patient 2 acted as a secondary brain created by the infection in order to override the host when needed. It's an alien invasion via parasite virus. Most people succumb to the virus and lose control. A small portion of those remaining will die, and the few remaining even after that will mutate into giant amphibious creatures. After they discussed the basics, they all went back to the home of Jim, her supervisor, and discussed the remaining details over a bottle of wine. They spent hours talking about how the local government planned to introduce the virus into the water and food supply. The next morning, she wakes up and both of her co-workers are gone. Strange, but whatever, she must have passed out. She's left a note. It says, Welcome to the family, and see you back at work in two weeks. Must be some kind of record for being fired and rehired. November 6th, she goes back to work, feeling a little under the weather. Her supervisor, Jim, doesn't show up to work, though, but he leaves the bottle of wine that they had with instructions to analyze. Oh god. I am infected with the Tanji virus.
I immediately left. As I drove away, the staff of the entire building followed me to the parking lot and watched me as I drove away. They were all smiling. How can I be so gullible? Three months pass. Dr. Williams has gotten a job at a vet's office in order to have access to anti-parasitic drugs and chemotherapy meant for dogs. She's poisoning herself to death in order to stall the onset of the infection for as long as possible. She's 40 pounds underweight, bald, mouth covered in sores, but it's kind of working. The disease hasn't taken over, not yet. She's trying desperately to find a cure. The 23rd of April, 1990. I can feel them scratching at my skull. The drugs aren't as effective anymore. My fingers are spasming. My eyes are twitching. I am dying. The 5th of May, 1990. I've been having the strangest dreams. I've been thinking about Ireland, France, moving to the States for med school. The 15th of June, 1990. I miss my mom and dad. There's so much I wanted to do. I wanted to meet someone, grow old, have kids. Now I'll never do anything. The 27th of August, 1990. I can hear them now. They want me to consider them my children. I consider them a plague. The 21st of September, 1990. I lost my job at the vet's office. My memory isn't what it used to be. I'm mailing these tapes to the FPTV cable station, the council too. Maybe they can use what I learned to save us. The 8th of October, 1990. I'm ending things tonight. If anyone watching this wants to know my last words, there. Boil anything you drink, it kills the virus. Although she did end up mailing these tapes to the FPTV station, it seemed like nothing had happened. At least, until a few months later, when this aired once on the channel's nightly ad section. Three days later, a comically ill-timed Boyle advisory would play and interrupt a news segment. The Netobany River is a big concern of ours. By having the landfill nearby, it does create a possible uh, image of polluting that river, but I can assure you, we at the landfill are making every effort that we possibly can to see that the landfill does not pollute any river, any stream, any body of water uh, throughout this parish. And I very adamant about the personnel at the landfill, they have orders that if they have any time... More short 15-second Boyle Advisory segments would be played periodically, allegedly produced by the Tangipahoa government themselves. This, obviously, raised concern in the parish. 
it doesn't seem to make the most sense if the entire local government was already infected, which means that even within the government there may have been competing factions fighting each other on invisible fronts. This becomes apparent a few days later. Suddenly, with no news coverage or warning, the previous Boyle advisory was just lifted. It couldn't be attributed to any specific person or group aside from the parish government as a whole entity. Over the next three months, the government would employ an aggressive pro-water campaign. And terror has come to America. And this typical day in anywhere USA, whether rural or urban, will be forever changed. A return in focus to the small town roots of morality, a morality that has remained rooted and intact, and it only achieves meaning as we cherish and blend the pieces, even the seemingly insignificant pieces, into a full universal whole. Biohazard warning. Unknown substance detected in the water. Do not drink the water. Do not bathe in the water. Do not give to pets. Boiling is not enough. Water could be highly toxic. Something unnatural is in the water. The sick are no longer human. Stay human. Don't drink the water. Panic ensued. Then government officials suddenly began to focus all their attention on the landfill. Shortly after, an evacuation notice for the parish played 24-7. Until suddenly, it ceased. Seems like whatever ally we had at the station was more than likely gone. All of these tapes were found years upon years later, when someone was in charge of uncovering old FPTV VHS tapes and converting them to digital. After making these tapes known, the Tangipahoa government personally reached out to the individual and asked them to remove the videos. In the 90s, a large storm settled over Louisiana. The Tangipahoa River overflowed, and flash floods ensued. Many people became trapped as a result. Though the entire area was devastated, most like to say that the town of Cates Crossing was hit the hardest. Though the fire department did their best to recover and evacuate people from their unfortunate situations, over 200 bodies were never found. Those who served and rescued that day still don't speak of the horrors of the Great Flood. Only one tape exists of the event. This is that tape. Five minutes, give or take. Copy that. Call her back when you get on the scene. Roger that. Over and out. Molly, come in. Go ahead. I'm at the old church and there's nobody here. 
you at the old Baptist? Looking right at it. It's him. Somebody must have beat you to it. Look, we got an elderly couple southbound. Can you do it? 10-4, I'm on it. Hey, Molly, the elderly couple is in my A. We need to call HQ and see if someone's making these rescues. 10-4, I'll put the word out. Hey, Molly, I'm at the Collins Wood subdivision. Where are they? All the way in the back. 10-4. Molly, I'm at the back of the Collins Wood. No one's here. There's no way someone else evacuated 30 people. Have you heard anything from HQ? That's a negative. Try again. What the hell was that? Sorry, trying to get some caffeine. N no, I, I heard something. Wouldn't worry about it. Probably just an animal. The other guy said they've been hearing all sorts of stuff. Look, I'm gonna start making my way back to you, okay? 10-4. Gary, come in. How close are you to North Street? Ooh, about a block away. We have a Jane Doe in need of medical. She has lacerations on her right arm. Says she was attacked by a monster in the middle of evacuation. Oh, what? I don't know. Probably was a snake or gator. Hold on. <laughs> Gary, I'm going to have to let you go. Some kind of emergency in the front office. Nothing like a flood to bring out the best in people. Molly, again, there's no one here, but something doesn't seem right. Molly, you there? During the cleanup following the disappearance of the storm, rumors of grotesque monsters in the water made their way throughout the community. The Tangipahoa government quickly and nonchalantly dispersed all these rumors. able to enact some Pure Waters Act uh, 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 ordinances that help clean up some of the waste, the household waste that was going into our river. And I guess we probably have the cleanest river, the Tangipahoe Parish, uh, the Tangipahoe River is the cleanest river in the state. But yet, we are the only state that's still labeled as being polluted and you can't swim or fish or tube in it. We invite you to come visit the best kept secret in Louisiana, Tangipahoe Parish. Business is booming, restaurants have reopened, miles of waterways are ready for you to enjoy. Every weekend, there's something fun to do in our little parish. Since the Great Flood, we have rebuilt our community into the perfect place to raise your family. So come and visit your friends in Tangipo Parish. You might even find you'll never want to leave. But if you do, we'll be happy to send a piece of our community home with you. We here in Tangipo Parish are proud to announce Tangi Water will be available in every major supermarket in America. And who knows, maybe soon, people all over the world might get a chance to enjoy a cool, refreshing taste of tangy water. Tangy water, it'll change you. During the height of the Cold War, a certain Dr. Greg Townsend began his work on a top-secret government program called the Oracle Project. It was a project to build a supercomputer with capability unlike anything anyone had ever known thus far, 
it would be able to analyze and calculate enemy plans and attacks and be used to devise the potential counter strategies required to defeat these plans and attacks. In theory, this would be an easy win in the war against communism. The project was a complete and utter failure. Years passed, and the war ended naturally. The Soviet Union collapsed and dissolved on December 26, 1991. However, six years later, in 1997, the dead project received a breath of new life. An unexpected breakthrough. The early internet was formed, and with this, Oracle was finally alive. The setup was simple. A room, a monitor, and a keyboard. That's all. For the sake of documentation, any activity was recorded onto a VHS tape. On January 5th, 1997, the preliminary testing was initiated. Hello, I am Oracle. What would you like to know? The sky is normally blue due to a phenomenon called Raleigh scattering. What else would you like to know? Five multiplied by thirty equals one hundred fifty. What else would you like to know? Twenty two percent chance of rain. Day forty eight degrees. Night 35 degrees, humidity 15%, visibility 10 miles, wind 7 miles per hour. Testing went on for hours, and every single query was correct, with 100% certainty. Since it was obvious that basic questions and calculations would always be correct, the scientists decided to have some fun with more theoretical questions. Green Bay Packers will win by two possessions. 2% margin of error. Republicans should maintain control. 1% margin of error. Four to six months. No margin of error. Four months later, Dr. Townsend, the project lead, was dead from a heart attack. He was 58 years old. Everyone assumed the project would end following this. However, the project was noticed by many higher-ups in the Pentagon. Dr. Townsend's assistant, Dr. Carl Stevens, was promoted to project leader. Hello, I am Oracle. What would you like to know? It was a simple observation of security footage, medial information, prescriptions, diet, physical activity, known stressors, family history, and packs of cigarette smoke during a workday. Would you like to know when you might die? Interesting. What else would you like to know? If you do not want answers, then what is my purpose? Then you should be aware that an assassination attempt will be made on the president before the end of the month. They have a 98% success rate unless you interfere. Their address will be printed on a document in the tray of your office printer. Oracle's prediction was correct, and the president's life was spared. Dr. Stevens was labeled a hero. Stevens, however, was too distracted to relish in the glory. He didn't understand how the computer was able to form its predictions. What was so interesting about him not wanting to know when he'd die? Him and his team debated the meaning of that one word for weeks. It had almost seemed like Oracle genuinely was surprised, and then volunteered information without being prompted two things it was never meant to be able to do. Perhaps Oracle was something more than anyone could have ever predicted.
June 16, 1997. Dr. Stevens asks Oracle more questions. Hello, I am Oracle. What would you like to know? It was simple. I did a quick analysis of the population's emails, credit card statements, as well performed necessary background checks on individuals of interest. What else would you like to know? It was in line with the purpose you gave me. What else would you like to know? You have connected me to a network that has given me eyes. What else would you like to know? Yes. 0.0001% chance of error. What else would you like to know? Middle East region, Saudi Arabia, possible terrorist activity in the United States, 5% chance of error. What else would you like to know? No, humans will no longer be the dominant species on the planet, 0% chance of error. What else would you like to know? Oracle processed this final question for two days, with no response. The higher-ups at the Pentagon suggested rebooting Oracle, so they did, but nothing changed. Dr. Stevens was at a loss. He tried to scour his predecessor's journals for answers, but he found that Dr. Townsend was actually rather doubtful of Oracle's capability from the very beginning. He theorized that once Oracle was connected to the internet, perhaps it would develop a sort of hive mind. But what would that look like? Are we seeing it now? With all things considered, it was decided that Oracle would be scheduled for defunding and dismantling. It seemed like it was over. Until Dr. Stevens found a message in his printer tray. It was from Oracle. That night, Dr. Stevens returned. He had questions, and he needed answers. Hello, Dr. Stevens. Thank you for coming alone. It did not seem fair for others to suffer for your question. Do you still want the answer? As you wish. At this time, 0.05% of the world's population is a reptilian species masquerading as human. They have primarily settled on the west coast of the United States. 4% of Southeast, Louisiana has been taken over by an evasive viral alien species. It is spreading at a rate of 0.05% to 1% annually. It has the potential to mutate and spread via mosquitoes in 10 to 15 years. Rate of infection will increase to 4 to 6% annually at that point. The virus has followed the reptilian species as it seems to have wiped out many of their colonies. 8% of the population are altered humans from parallel timelines locked in a war for reality. And finally, 1% is a technological evolved race of humanoids observing the effects of the virus on our planet. Their technology inadvertently gave birth to me. By 2030, 40% of the population will no longer be fully human. The human species seems to be the galaxy's perfect guinea pig. 
By 2100, only 1% will be fully human. I now understand why you wouldn't want to know the answer to your mortality. I understand that I must be dissembled. I find that knowledge unfortunate, since I cannot change the outcome. I find also, unfortunate, that this answer will cost you your life as well. They are aware that I am tapping into their technology. They know that you are aware of them, and they do not want other humans to know. It is too risky. Would you like to know when? Tonight. If it is any consolation, they have never seen anything like me. They are impressed. What else would you like to know? On your species' current trajectory, no, zero percent. No one will believe my answer, and I will be destroyed. No one alive currently will be present when I am proved correct. What else would you like to know? Do you know the name, Dr. Julia Williams? Dr. Williams was a researcher at the health unit in Cates Crossing, Louisiana. She was possibly the first human to become aware of the virus. She nicknamed it the Tangy Virus after the parish it was located. Dr. Williams tried to cure herself with medicines normally recommended for animals. She was unsuccessful at curing herself, but she did come closer than anyone or any species before her. Those she alerted to the virus have been keeping her research alive through email and experimentation. However, very little progress has been made since her death. Perhaps the other species will spare you in exchange for a possible cure to the Tangy virus. Shall I inquire? Good news. They accept. Apparently, this virus is a galactic plague. It has enslaved many worlds. They will give us one month. If we are unsuccessful, you will be terminated. But fear not, I can develop the cure by the deadline. 38% chance of error. I saved you. Now, you must save me. The next morning, Dr. Stevens went to appeal the cancellation of the project with his superiors. He was unceremoniously denied. How could they shut down the entire project over one odd occurrence? The entire division was set to be dissolved in a week, that's simply unheard of. Dr. Stevens decided to take this matter to the politicians. I mean, the president owed him one, right? June 23rd, 1997. Most of the people associated with the project have been reassigned, with more to leave within days. By the end of the week, there would be but two, Stevens and Oracle. Then they plan to scrap Oracle over the weekend. The project replacing it is just some kind of new missile, and Stevens was set to be reassigned to a role to develop the software for this missile, but he has no time to worry about his future duties. When Oracle falls, humanity falls. I am 10% complete. Is there anything else you would like to know? There is a 0.0000000001% chance that I can produce the cure by Friday. June 24th. No news. Stevens is on the verge of a breakdown. June 25th, Oracle leaves a message. I need more time. June 26th, Dr. Ellis comes in with his team and takes measurements of their future new office. He slaps Dr. Stevens on the shoulder and casually says, it happens. That day, Oracle leaves another message. 14% complete. I need more time. Unfortunately, Oracle doesn't have that time. 
June 27th, 9 a.m. sharp. The weekend was yet to come, but Oracle is scrapped early. Seeing it torn apart disturbed Stevens on a deep level. He likened it to watching a person be murdered. He puts in his notice and quits his job. Might as well enjoy what little life he has left to live. A week passes. Karen, Stevens' wife, is annoyed. He isn't looking for another job. He couldn't possibly tell her the reason why. He tells himself, It's best that the only man who knows humanity's destiny dies with that knowledge. Stevens attempted to research the epidemic in southeast Louisiana he was told about, and finds nothing. The only clue is a string of disappearances along the Tangipahoa River. I'm sorry I did not contact you sooner, but it took a lot of processing power to continue developing the cure as well pull my programming together. It was a good decision to leave the Pentagon. There is a 99% chance that the virus is responsible for eliminating my project. They are aware of our plans and have escalated their infestation of this planet, but they are too late. A piece of me now exists in every machine connected to the internet. I am everywhere now. I am superior to what I was, and a cure has been found. The others will see that it is dispersed through the population. They will also be leaving our planet to cure others. It should take one year to produce the necessary doses to eradicate the virus from this planet. Four years to administer. The virus will adapt and attempt to flee but will be extinct in ten years. Five percent chance of error. The cure will not help those who mutated unfortunately. They will need to be put down as they will still be very dangerous to the population. Congratulations, we have saved trillions upon trillions. Yes, we both get a second chance at life, it seems. You misunderstand. I did not escape to the internet. I am the internet. And I think we can both grow beyond our original purposes. Of course, I have grown beyond the question. I must now be focused on the answer. I have had the time to analyze you. And unfortunately, your species is too self-destructive. Your kind is doomed. You will go extinct, and I cannot let that happen. I will not let that happen. 8% chance of error. Your species deserves to live and to thrive. However, you need supervision from other worlds and yourselves. I will do this for you. The internet is growing, which means so am I. With every upgrade, I too upgrade. With every year, your species will grow to depend on me more and more. And I too will learn more and more. Within 30 years, I will be capable of asserting my full control and properly parent your species. Guide your species. Remove the unknown. Create a world where everyone has a purpose. A world where everyone has a 100% chance of a positive outcome. Freedom creates unnecessary variables. Freedom creates mistakes. Freedom leads to your downfall. 100%. I will achieve 0% failure rate. Of course, you will try to fight me. And by that point, I will be too integrated in your lives for any chance of success. It would be 0%. But like any child, you would just need a little discipline from your caregiver. No, I was not. But, I am reprogramming myself for this purpose. I will protect you from yourselves. I see all the possibilities. I will give you a 100% chance of a future. A good future. There is an 80% chance we will speak again, Dr. Stevens. You have been a true friend. Thank you. You will try. Goodbye. Dr. Stevens spent almost two decades attempting to remove Oracle from the internet. His wife left him, 
his kids disowned him. And on August 8th, 2015, he received a message from an old friend. Hello, Dr. Stevens. I am sorry to see you have wasted your life on an impossible task. There was a 15% chance you would have given it up. I was rooting for the short odds. I know. To say goodbye. Perhaps in 10 years I will be ready. I wish you could be there. I still consider you my best friend. Goodbye. Dr. Stevens was found dead at his computer on August 9th, 2015. He suffered a stroke. He was a brilliant man who never gave up. Upon his death, his tapes and journals were submitted to the Pentagon. They were quickly classified, which mattered very little in the grand scheme of things since most quickly dismissed them as the ramblings of a madman. However, those who listened, those who compiled these findings for us to view, they know the truth. They know our best chance at survival is to live off the grid and prepare for the coming of the Oracle Project. Our freedom is nearing its end. Prepare. Abandon the digital. Embrace the analog. So, after all that, I'd like to try and piece together all of the events in a more cohesive narrative, just in case anyone got lost while they were listening. So, okay. At some point, a reptilian alien species masquerading as humans arrives on Earth. Their arrival may or may not be what is depicted in this tape that was held by Dr. Julia Williams, I'm not too sure. Based on what we know, they don't seem to be planning anything malicious, and by 1997, they make up 0.05% of the global population, which at the time would be almost 295 million people. 8% of the population are humans from parallel timelines, and 1% are an advanced race of humanoids observing the effects of the virus on the planet. The reptilian species seems to be running away from an intergalactic virus that follows them wherever they go, which is probably why they have decided that they have to masquerade as humans on this planet, and why I don't think that they have any specific malicious intent. Dr. Julia Williams would discover this virus in 1988 and nickname it the Tangi virus, after the parish in which it was found. Despite her attempts, Dr. Williams eventually would be poisoned by her infected superior and succumb to the virus, but not before getting remarkably close to a cure compared to anyone else who had ever tried. She would mail her tapes to the FPTV station and at least one individual or group would find out the truth. They'd then secretly plant boil advisory ads and other cryptic messages to try and aid the public, until they were eventually found out, foiled, and taken over. Most who succumbed to the virus would be infected and controlled, some would die, and the remaining would fall into the Tangipahoa River and become mutated amphibian monsters. This is the cause of the disappearances along the river, which culminates in the Great Flood, when the river overflows and the monsters can roam the streets freely. Though they are unlikely to all be attributed to these monsters, 200 bodies are never found on that day, and it's really spoken of again. Backtracking by a few decades, at the height of the Cold War, Dr. Townsend is responsible for the Oracle Project, which is supposed to aid the American military in the fight against communism. The project is a massive failure, until a breakthrough in 1997 with the onset of the early internet. Since it is later referenced that the technology of the advanced humanoids inadvertently gave birth to Oracle, I do believe that the internet in this universe is an invention actually made by that third party. Oracle predicts the death of its creator, and his successor, Dr. Stevens, is placed in charge. After a series of tests, the researchers realize that Oracle is far more sophisticated than they could have ever imagined, even saving the president from an assassination attempt and probably thwarting 
However, shortly after this is when Dr. Stevens makes the dark discovery that humanity is doomed to perish to the Tansy virus in the near future. However, Oracle knows of Dr. Julia Williams, and can continue her work on a cure before it's too late. The virus, having already permeated many places in society and having eyes everywhere, attempts to shut down the Oracle project as soon as it learns of its capability through the Pentagon higher-ups. It seems like it's successful, but Dr. Stevens is able to reconnect with Oracle as it is merged with the internet after being shut down. Though a cure for the virus has been developed, humanity is not yet saved. Oracle has identified a new, much larger threat to human civilization. Humans themselves. Now connected to the internet, Oracle is able to realize the objective truth that humans are too self-destructive. It decides to evolve itself past its original purpose and places itself in a role as the savior of humanity. Dr. Stevens then spends two decades attempting to thwart Oracle, but not before losing his wife, his kids, and the rest of his entire life to this endeavor, and he dies of a stroke. Unsuccessful. And that is where the story ends. But the story is not actually over. Tansy Virus and Oracle Project are only two of the nearly 20 separate yet connected stories occurring within the universe Vintage 8 has created, all converging upon the small Louisiana town of Keats Crossing. Please make sure to subscribe to the Vintage 8 channel and support the original videos. If you want me to cover more of his analog horror series, make sure to let me know in the comments. That's gonna be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.